Chairman Volker, what, what did you hear today in light of the report you and your group have produced? Where do your thoughts go from here? Well, I was interested in this last session, particularly because it's right in our field of how the government is managed and all the rest. And I thought there was a, quite a lot of sympathy for change, which there should be, because when you ask people in the agencies, you ask people in the market, is the present system work? They say, no, it's cumbersome, it's overlapping, it's got gaps. Are you willing to change it? No. <laughs> they, all, they all like their own agency or whatever. But you know, I keep remembering things that happened uh, way in the past. <clears throat> I was a young guy in the Treasury in the early 1960s. The controller of the currency is technically in the Treasury, but he did not want to pay attention to the Secretary of the Treasury, much less the Undersecretary, and even less to the Deputy Undersecretary, which was me. Uh, and there was a lot of... Uh, kind of conflict all along. The Treasury Secretary got so frustrated, his inability to manage the control of the currency, he said, Paul, you're gonna be the liaison guy to the <laughs> control of the currency. Control of the currency had as much interest in la lazing, or whatever the word is, with me as a man in the moon. But, uh, you know, they, back when I was at Chase Manhattan, we used to complain about the control of the currency because Chase Manhattan was a state bank and subject to Federal Reserve regulation. And we always complained about the laxity then of the control of the currency who was, in fact, did try to expand banking practices all the time. It was uh, uh, laxity in regulation, laxity in competition. Uh, to say everything. And one other one, it's really, I, I'm sorry, but I, I just remember these things when I, I was a relatively uh, new chairman of the Federal Reserve, but I've been around for a while. But one day I'm in a board meeting in January 1980, and the chairman of Bates calls me up, gets me out of the board meeting, says, you've got to close the silver market because we're going to go bankrupt tomorrow. If the price of silver goes any further, we're out of business. So what do I say? How many authority to close the silver market even if I wanted to? The first thing I think of, well, silver is a commodity. I'll call up the chairman of the commodity agency where I'll get some information. I called them up. I said, hey, what can you tell me about the situation of the silver market and the exposure of the financing? He said, I can't tell you. It's confidential. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we didn't do anything about the silver market, but it stabilized for a day and saved Bates' uh, skin. But uh, one thing that comes up with FSOC, which we are proposing some changes in, more or less along the lines that uh, Barney or uh, Mr. Weiss has said, but it's a tricky business having been in the Treasury, having been in the Federal Reserve, what is the relationship between the Treasury and the banking agencies in general? And actually, when I was a young guy in the Treasury, it was quite close between the Treasury and the Federal Reserve by an accident of history. A lot of the Federal Reserve officials, including me, have been in the Federal Reserve, uh, including people much superior to me. Uh, but when you look at FSOC and the negotiation about FSOC, there are two complaints. One, the Secretary of the Treasury has too much authority. That gets the whole thing involved in politics. The other complaint is he had too little. And what is the right place? It was evident in the middle of the crisis that the regulatory agencies, the Federal Reserve and its great independence, was not going to proceed except in cooperation with the administration and the Treasury. When you get into that kind of situation, you need cooperation between the the agencies of government in a wider sense. We've tried to uh, produce the baby rightly by saying, yes, the Secretary of the Treasury ought to familiarize himself with what the agencies are doing. He can call the meetings, he can set the agenda, but when it comes to decision making, he should not vote. He can say what he wants to say to influence them, but he shouldn't be directly involved in the decision because of concern about the politicization of the agency and keeping at least the appearance of the formality of independence. 
So uh, it's just a couple of the things that occurred to me when I uh, was listening to this conversation. People forget about we had crises before. The silver crisis was a big crisis. I, the price of silver had been hanging around $4 of an ounce, I guess, forever. Bunker Hunt tried to corner the market. The price went up to 50 Everybody was turning in the family heirloom silver to put it to the <laughs> smelter to make a little money. And suddenly it went from 50 in a matter of a week or so to 14 which is when I got the, the call from Bates. Uh, but this took uh, a lot of... Uh, consideration of what you can do with a speculative uh, crisis of that sort. Were you there, Don, at that point? And you, you'd already arrived. Uh, well, anyway, ask me questions and I'll All right. spout it. All right, right. we'll keep it rolling here. <laughs> let's, let's go back. You've, you founded this organization called the Volcker Alliance. What was inside your imagination in forming in forming the organization. What, what was your sense well, of purpose? Well, this goes back in that long personal history. <clears throat> I went to something, I went to Princeton, and they had a thing there called the Woodrow Wilson School. It wasn't called the Woodrow School then, but it's now a Woodrow Wilson School. It was a superb undergraduate program that combined economics and politics, and you had to do some independent work, which was really unusual. But it was an undergraduate program. They had a tiny graduate program. They were given, long after, 10 years after I left, they were given what was then reputedly the biggest single gift ever given to a university with the specific purpose of training for the public service. There was, and there was a lot of yes. negotiation about the contract and all the rest and some independence retained. But Princeton didn't have their heart in it. And here they, meanwhile, I'd gone off to Harvard and the Harvard Graduate School of Public Administration. But here was a great gift to a leading university which had the potential for increasing the whole status of training for public service, in my opinion. And uh, they used the money for other purposes, and mainly to finance the political science department, the economics department. But what really uh, hurt my feelings, I'm just telling you anecdotes here, well, I was teaching at Princeton later, I happened to be talking casually to some young economics professor. And I don't remember what, I think we were going to the then Woodrow Wilson School. I said, you know this university isn't paying enough attention to training for public service, as it's supposed to be. He says, who cares about that? That's not a discipline the way economics is. <laughs> Which hurt my feelings, given what I... Uh, so I said, well, you know, that's very fine, but you know the president of Princeton, when I came here, and then the graduate was a professor of public administration. He said, I do not believe it. This great university would not have a professor of public administration <laughs> as its president. And I said, well, it was fortunate that Woodrow Wilson kind of got through that <laughs> sometime before. But uh, Harvard was run very much like the Woodrow Wilson School, actually. They had their heart to some degree in public administration, but it was kind of taken over by politics and, and economics. They tried to change that when it went to the Kennedy School. But the, it became the Kennedy School with a group of professors, mostly economists, who said, let's modernize education for public service. And we're, we're Harvard, we'll raise some money, and we're gonna, none of this business of diluting it this is our mission. And this is the way it started, and it went okay for a few years, but they didn't have any money. And there you know at Harvard, every school was on its own boat, or whatever they call it. And they eventually got a great fundraiser who raised all sorts of money, but it wasn't for public administration. They got centers for public policy of this, and centers for Asia, and centers for South America, centers for nonprofit institutions. They got more centers than it doesn't think tanks in Washington. But meanwhile, the public administration is still there. They, they still have some dedication to it. Public management, better way. You can't even use public administration. I, I tell all this because this has been on my mind. And I mean, I spent 30 years in the government. And 
I'll ask sophisticated people here, how many people do you think federal civilian employees there are today compared to 50 years ago in the Kennedy administration? Who knows the answer to that question? The answer is the same. There were two million then, there are two million now, with little ups and downs. How can you manage a government which is five times as big in real spending with the same amount of dirty old bureaucrats that don't do anything? Well, I'll tell you, Defense Department outsources $400 billion of expenditures themselves. And there's another four or five hundred billion that are going out. So we've got no more civil servants, but we've got a hell of a lot of contractors. And Washington is a very prosperous city. <laughs> Partly because of lobbyists, and the rest of it's because of the contractors, and it's hard to tell the difference between the two very often. So I've been kind of preoccupied with this subject. So I, when I finally looking for something to do and not get involved in monetary policy or something, uh, I decided I would try to encourage a little, and a few people encouraged me to do this. And so it's a small organization, but we'll get, I, I, we put some little financing together and we can get some financing for particular projects like this. It's a project you can get financing for on the side. But basically, I want to see more attention paid to uh, management and public, because I think the losses, the difficulties in management are part of the reason we've got this serious loss of trust in government, which doesn't help anything. But I also want to re-stimulate some interest in uh, the academic community. You know, we got together with a bunch of deans because we want to work with them as closely as we can. They were, what's on your mind? We asked them, what can we do to help? And there are a lot of things that will come along. The first thing on their mind, interesting enough, is how do we get tenure for professors of public administration? There has not been a tenured professor in the Kennedy School in public administration since the years of the formation as a Kennedy School. And these guys are all 65 if they're young, 75 if they're a little older. But, uh, but all the younger teachers, and some of them are good teachers and dedicated and all the rest, but you know, they got this little signal behind them. He's a professor of so-and-so, uh, what do they call it? They've got a couple of euphemisms that come here. Uh, uh, professor, oh God, I forget, I forget the euphemism that's used, but every professor in the world knows when that euphemism is used, that means he hasn't got tenure. Uh, where at, at Princeton, go back to my, I mean, God, I've been going on and on here. Woodrow Wilson School now has a graduate program, endowments entirely for the graduate program, of 150 students. The endowment is close to a billion dollars for that school, because the, the original gift has fructified. What do they use that money for? Well, an old buddy of mine in the economics department, I was there at a reunion a year or so ago, he says, you know, we now have 50 professors of economics she said, well, what do we do with them all? This is my, my economics friend. Well, that was a good question. What do we do with them all? I found myself sitting at lunch with a, one of the professors who I didn't know, but he happened to be, I didn't even realize it, which tells you something. He'd won a Nobel Prize. They got several Nobel Prize winners. But I said, is it true? You have 50 professors now of economics in Princeton? He said, I don't know how many it is. We have quite a few. But don't worry about it. They're all paid for by the Woodrow Wilson School. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is what we're fighting. <laughs> and uh, I can go back to the outsourcing. There's nothing the matter with outsourcing if you know what you're doing. And there are good reasons for outsourcing and there are bad reasons for outsourcing. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, the government is not adequately commit, committed in skills for people who can really expertly pick the outsourcer and monitor the outsourcer and pay attention to what they're doing. And one of the first requests we got was from GSA who wanted a little study of what quality should we look for in civil servants so we can boost our outsourcing capabilities. 
the deans are interested in this now, and it will be a major project, uh, next major project, I think. If we can get a dozen of the leading schools together and worry about what the curriculum should be on, on public management in general, but with some concentration on how you outsource or procurement, I think it will be a help. So it's very pretty pedestrian, but there we are. Yes, sir. Um, He's supposed to answer the yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll get to you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you talked about rebuilding public trust in government. And one dimension which I heard in your, your statement just a moment ago relates to improving the quality of the people who will be in that position. But I have another thought that uh, actually kind of burst forth one night when I was on Lou Dobbs' program. I said to him at the time that whenever I'm on Fox News, people are berating the government. And what bothered me was there is a difference between a narrow mandate for government and a broad mandate for government on the one hand, and a quality civil service or a, a denigrated and deficient civil service. And what I felt was happening is that people who didn't agree they thought the brand aid should be narrower, tried to accomplish that by destroying the training and the quality of the civil service. And that feeds a distrust in every aspect of government. And as you say, given the size of the government, even with a narrow mandate, you need quality people just because there's yeah. so much exactly. responsibility. You know, one of the ironies about all this is one of the biggest uh, bureaucracies in the world must be the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. or the U.S. military generally. But they have paid attention to recruitment and training programs. And we, you know, we got a crisis. All of a sudden, we decide, we find out we've got six very able generals that are able to, to run the Pentagon, but run other things too. Uh, and that's because they pay attention to the, both the recruitment and the education in the system. Nobody goes to higher rank in the Navy and the Army without going to the schools and the war colleges. Mm -hmm. And the war colleges are not entirely about war, they're partly about management and administration. Take, there's a program in, after my youth, but strong program called Presidential Management Fellows or Interns or something. This is the vehicle to get good young men and women in government. Mm -hmm. And they would be picked out the best of the crop in the professional schools and they'd be given kind of accelerated treatment and training when they got in government. That program, which was the prize program for people in schools of public management and public policy, years ago it still exists, but it's floundering. It's no longer got the prestige or whatever. The more complaints about recruitment in the government, you hear it over and over again, and you're sick and tired of hearing it. In these schools of uh, public policy, if somebody wants to go in the government, he's a good student, and some agency wants to hire him. Typically, they're in school, they've got to figure out what they're going to do when they graduate in May or June. They make contact with the agency, the agency says, yeah, you're a good candidate, we really want you, but we can't put you on the, uh, we can't really hire you until the next budget session, which is in October. Now, how many of them can sit there from uh, March to February until October, knowing whether they really got the job or whether they don't, and have to go through all kinds of security yeah. clearances and yeah. everything else. So more and more of them say, okay, sorry, <laughs> but we're not going to make this connection. It seems like a very simple thing to do something about it, but can we restore? You know, some people interested in making a real presidential fellowship program, whatever you want to call it, and simply making the recruiting and employment system more efficient. <laughs> mm -hmm. If we're going to make the government more efficient, we better get the people in it to make it more efficient. Well, you have uh, governments, the one that's off inside is Singapore. And where? Is Singapore, where they pay Singapore, people yeah. very well, they train them very well. What I said to Lou Dobbs that night was I think we could have a narrow mandate but agree that everybody should be trained with the same vigor and resources that the special forces have 
when they go after Osama bin Laden. That in every walk of life in government, we, we should explicitly debate what, how broad the mandate should be. And I know Kevin, like you, talked about the fallibility of regulators, even well-intentioned regulators. That has to be incorporated into the, the assessment of how much power or discretion they have. But well-trained, well-paid people with a narrow mandate is a much healthier system than one that is tarnished by essentially the self-fulfilling prophecy of incompetent and undernourished, both financially budget training, public Are there officials. really two big crises that we've flunked about in recent years? <laughs> or Katrina, that had a reorganized department, that had the federal emergency management part of that department had been totally politicized by President Bush's buddy and others, uh, and they just were unable to respond to one of the big natural crises we had. And then you had the great Obama showpiece of Obamacare, very complicated, maybe much too complicated to start with, but it was inadequately managed. It was outsourced. <laughs> it's yeah. an interesting case of outsourcing with ineffective results. Um, but you know, you can name what, the big oil spill. I, I don't know anything about oil spills and drilling for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. I didn't know. But there is an agency that's whole purpose is safety on offshore drilling. Where were they? I mean, they were no place. I, uh, mm. I, I don't think they'd, you know, ever inspected anything so far as I know. But, you know, we get these incidents over the, the VA is, uh, I, mean, I know a little bit about that one, but the VA has a problem that all the sick veterans that want to live in the South and most of them came from the north, and when they set up the VA hospitals, they set them all up in the north, and they didn't set them up in the south. And now the, the applicants want to go to Phoenix or Palm Springs, wherever they're going, and they've got a surplus of doctors in Boston and a shortage in, in Phoenix, and they weren't able to uh, manage it in a way that, you know, is damaging to the... Veterans Administration image as well as the government's image. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's not all personnel that you know the Congress gets involved in all these things and doesn't act as flexibly as you might like. Now the the um, financial agencies are exempt from some of this. I mean, people do want to work for the Federal Reserve and they do want to work for the F FDIC these days because they've got a good reputation, so they're not so bad, and they're independent, independently financed. They can do the recruiting and all the rest, but that's not true of the government generally. So when you were watching the presidential debates this year and the various messages, and you heard the president-elect talk about the system is rigged, how did, how, how did the Volcker Alliance envision <laughs> reacting to that challenge? <laughs> That's a sui generis <laughs> challenge, Mr. Trump. <laughs> I don't think I know how we're going to react to that, but you know, in all this, you would have liked in your imagination uh, that someplace during the debates or someplace during the campaign, somebody would express a little concern about the efficiency and effectiveness of government. I don't think there was one word about that in the whole campaign. I, I would have liked one of the candidates, yeah, I'm worried about the effectiveness of government. When I get to be president, I'm going to do something about it. I don't get that feeling, unfortunately. Maybe it's there, but it's pretty well hidden. So if I can stir up a little interest, <laughs> that would be a plus. But Because any president is going to find that his hands are tied to some extent if he hasn't really got an effective uh, bureaucracy. Yeah, the person who I saw handle that very well in a public forum was when Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown were debating one night in Massachusetts. I was present. And she, she walked in and she said, all of you here, he is your senator. And I think he and I agree on one thing. We agree that government isn't working right. <laughs> said, but, and then she quoted Ronald Reagan. And she said, Reagan said 
government isn't the solution, government is the problem. And she said, this is where I differ. I think we have to have good government, but it's not this one. I understand your disappointment. And at some level, the open agenda in my question about the system is rigged is what can be done to restore the trust and the faith in government, which reflects on our entire society. Well, we're doing what we can in our little organization. I don't know well, what other you're areas in the right spot. But one of the areas, you know, everybody talks about infrastructure. It's going to save everything. It's going to create prosperity and budget surpluses and all that stuff. Uh, first of all, infrastructure doesn't come very easily. I mean, good infrastructure, it takes a lot of plant. What is this thing, this pipeline in North, South Dakota? After all this planning, they built 90% of the pipeline. Uh, at this late date, the Army says you can't build <laughs> You can't put it across the river? <laughs> Didn't somebody think of getting a license before? Um, I don't know <laughs> where, the, where the difficulty comes from, but... Oh God, what got me off on on that track? I, um, I don't know. I lost track of my own. Uh, Janine, do we have a, a handheld microphone uh, that people can can help us with? We can go back to some of this finance stuff. Right? Hello, so I teach in the Shar School of Government and Policy at George Mason University, and so I'm wondering- At what university? George Mason. George Mason. So I'm wondering whether you would see fit to um, collaborate with us potentially and how we get in contact with you. <laughs> we only and want to collaborate in absolutely top flight schools. They have their heart in. <laughs> okay, well, we're on our way up. Um, so my question is, is really about ethics. So how do we, can, in, in the current climate, talk to students, masters and PhD students who are working in public policy in one capacity or another, and who, and as you pointed out, a lot of people are contractors. The current figure, the most recent statistic on that is three quarters of people who do the work of federal government, three quarters are actually private contractors, while budget has increased, what, fivefold or such. Um, but how do we talk to students? How should we talk to students about working um, for government when they see the yes. model of many people, elite top players, using government just as a step on the ladder yes. to get out and make a lot of money? What should we be talking to, to students about along those lines? And that it does have to do with the system um, being okay. rigged, of okay. course. Yeah, I haven't got an answer for you, I'm afraid, but I know it's a difficult and relevant area. The inner or outer is, uh, you know, we should have people coming in from business at the upper levels of government time to time and going out. And some of them are very successful, some of them, many people, I run into any number of people that come in from outside and govern at an upper level. And they either stay or they leave, but a lot of them think this is the most interesting thing I've done in my life. I'm glad I did it. Now, not everybody <laughs> feels that way, but some do. But how can you get advantage of that experience and leadership that you need without running into the people that are doing it? You know, you, I could put it bluntly, you get some people interested in government because they didn't get the promotion in their own business. So they kind of say, well, I'll go in government for a while and that'll reboot me for jobs in the private sector. <laughs> um, it's, we'll get to George Mason, we'll have a special study of this in the Volcker Alliance to see how we can deal with this problem. But there is a, somebody, well, Mr. Trump talks about tightening up the, uh, the, uh, the revolving door, and it's, you know, it's obviously it should be, well, look, the worst thing about the United States government now is the revolving door in the Congress, so far as I, you know, when you have congressmen telling you that I'm ready to leave the Congress because they'd rather have a job lobbying, where I'll make a lot more money and have more influence, you know you've got a problem. Yeah. Andy? 
fascinating conversation, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I wanted to put in a plug uh, uh, for um, getting young people involved in this conversation, uh, even at an earlier level than we're talking about today. Um, and, and I've been active in mer very, uh, for, very, for very many years uh, with the Junior State of America, it used to be called the Junior Statesman of America, but there, um, there are many groups that pr uh, help promote uh, civic education, civics in school, um, engagement, debate, uh, you, you hold very strong beliefs on both sides, but the fact that you can talk to each other and work together uh, is so critical. So I wanted to just put that on the table as we need to make sure to engage well, you young know, people. By coincidence, somebody has contacted me who knows some very rich person who he thinks is interested in precisely what you're talking about and get these kids at high school. And I'm a little leery of it, not because I think it's a terrible idea, but I'm not sure that our little organization can have much leverage in that particular area. But I don't know, this guy walks in with $100 million, I'll, <laughs> I'll rethink it. But uh, I don't, it's a very relevant question. I just think it's probably too much for us. Malloy, I started out as a young Foreign Service officer over 50 years ago. I worked at State as a Foreign Service guy, at Justice, Senate Banking Committee, a political appointee at Commerce under President Clinton, and then 10 years on the China Commission. So I, I have over 45 years You've watching, done your bit, watching right? this system. <laughs> and here's what I see. This contracting out of all this stuff they get, they get paid more than the guys that are in the government agencies. So the guys in the government agencies feel they have to get out in order to take care of their families and get them and their children educated. Then you have on the Hill, you mentioned the members, but it's the staff as well. We used to say if you left that you were selling out when you went with a lobbying firm or a law firm that was, that was their function. Now they say they're cashing in. The whole <laughs> structure and ethics of this whole thing needs a real examination, and we've got to find some way to re-incentivize the system because it's not serving the people of our country very You much. and I are the old school. You've got to help us. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to. I don't know how you... Uh, we're quite open to questions on finances, too. But <laughs> Take it back to something you were talking about this morning, and my question is whether we have to wait for the next financial crisis to define the perimeters of the safety net, or is it something that we could do in advance? Is it possible? Well, you know, this is a big confusing issue. My view of the thing is uh, we've got in Dodd-Frank a, a, I almost said bailout. <laughs> It's not a bailout, it's a liquidation formula for large, bankrupt financial institutions. And there's a lot of question whether that's all paper and never work in practice. And I can understand all that skepticism, but there's been a lot of work on it. And I think the FDIC in particular, but with the Federal Reserve, had developed an approach that I think could be workable. And one of the more promising things about it, you can't deal with one of these big failing institutions without going international because they are themselves international. And my understanding, when I'm not close to it, I know a little bit more about what's going on in the United States, the Brits have come up with a very parallel system. The European community is a little behind, but sympathetic and working on it, and the Japanese are working on it. But once you get... Uh, Britain and the United States on the same liquidation wicket, uh, you've taken care of 85% of the problem. Now, the other 15% may be important too, but I, I'm not as cynical or skeptical as many people are as the unworkability of this thing. I, don't, I know there's proposals from some group, mostly conservative Republicans, I guess, and say, no, no, we've got to do it through the courts. And I don't know what the I don't know what the object is, frankly. I, they don't seem to object to the procedure, but somehow you've got to go to a federal judge 
and get it in the established bankruptcy channel when we have an organization called the FDIC that is specially equipped to take care of bankruptcies of financial institutions. Why do we want to complicate the thing further and go into a legal system that has no experience in this particular problem and when you trigger a bankruptcy and, and a bankruptcy that will involve, as Dodd-Frank permits, some transitional financing to keep the thing going while you're liquidating or selling off to pieces. Now, maybe there's a better answer, but I don't know of any better answer on the table. So that's all I can say, that that procedure can be extended to non-banking institutions, which I guess is what we're proposing. But if you've got a better proposal, you've been around, well, we'll add that to our next report. <laughs> but I. Uh, I think it's not unreasonable. I, I, it's obviously a very difficult thing. You got this philosophy that was discussed this morning. There are two different philosophies. One philosophy is you've got a crisis, pour the money in and take care of it, and we'll worry about moral hazard later. And then they say, and that will require even stricter regulation so that people don't run wild. And then there's the other philosophy, which I think is in Dodd-Frank, and I guess historically when I was a researcher, really, you, you got a special arrangement for banks, but we don't want to extend that to everybody else. And you um, do things like what we're talking about this morning, about the excesses of short-term financing, because that's where the the crisis may originate someplace else, and it probably will originate someplace else, but what makes it serious is the, is the cascading panic that's involved. It's the running for, for home, and if we can take, if we can minimize the runnability problem, it's the theory of what we proposed this morning, you could retain the distinction between banks and non-banks. I think the implication of what we're saying is that this very strong tendency for banks to become smaller and smaller, banks in the whole, become smaller and smaller part of the financial markets would be reversed and some of the financing that takes place in non-banks would have to return to the banking system, which I think would probably be a good thing because that's regulated. Over here. Uh, Art Wilmer at GW Law School, uh, wanted to obviously congratulate Chairman Volker for continuing this very important effort. I, I would suggest that, you, that personal incentives, I think, are really critical. Maybe more attention could be given on personal incentives. To the what? On, on personal incentives. You know, not just structural yeah. issues, but personal incentives. So I would certainly echo the prior speaker who said, from my experience, having been in Washington a long time, a lot of people leave government, at least purportedly, because they can't educate their kids in, in costly colleges. So whether attention on scholarships for long-term government service with a requirement for further government service might be a very productive program to look a, into. Well, we want to work with the schools and people in government to work on this kind of thing. It's very difficult. I, I used to think when I was in the Federal Reserve, you know, that the government introduced this bonus system. For, and you could give a $5,000 bonus, or in exceptional cases, I guess you could give a $10,000 bonus. The Federal Reserve Board spent more time discussing bonuses for employees than they did on monetary policy. <laughs> it, it creates an impossible problem. You know, do you give Joe 5,000 and Sally that he works with isn't going to get anything and morale will plunge down and this other guy got 10,000? It's, it's, like, <laughs> it's like when my short career as an investment banker, <laughs> is everybody's career, comes bonus time. So you give some young fellow who's had a really terrific year, he's doing fine, you say, Charlie, you're, this is some years ago, things have gotten worse. Said, you're going to get a bonus of $4 million this year. He says, geez, I know that's a lot of money and I don't deserve it, but that son of a bitch in the next office is getting a $5 million bonus. <laughs> <laughs> Such penny ante stuff in the government that I didn't know whether we were doing good or harm by all this bonus system. But, I know it took a it took a lot of work in my day. They may do it more. Fit. Do you still have bonuses now? I... Well, let me throw the, <laughs> Maybe the, do a lot the, more the light in the other direction. And I think you know. I think the the failure of the agencies 
to implement the 956 rules, which were mandated to be done 18 months after Dodd-Frank, is the greatest single fail. The 956 incentive compensation rules, which were required to be done 18 months after enactment, and they're not done today. That is the single greatest failing of the Dodd-Frank structure. And it shows most, press, most powerfully the, in, the industry's continuing influence and power. And I would suggest that if you said to the CEOs and the senior people at these, at these institutions, look, half or more of your money is going to be locked up long term. There aren't going to be any clawbacks. You aren't going to get that money until a certain number amount of time after you leave, whether it's deferred stock, whether it's contingent capital, you're just not going to get that money until three to five years after you leave. That would change their incentives completely. These are smart, motivated people. Right now, their incentives are all upfront motivated. If we made them long term, they lose that. They don't, there's no clawback because clawbacks don't work. They lose that if, if the institution does badly. That would change things radically. But the system is such that those rules cannot get out of the agencies. And I think that is a terrible uh, reflection, in my opinion, on where we are right now. There are yeah, so many things to do. But I, you know, talking about the laws not being followed, it took how many years to do the great Volcker rule? Because every agency had an idea. There was a dozen agencies involved, or half a dozen agencies involved. They all had their own ideas. They went through the S. We've got a law on the books that I have some feeling about, because I think I originated it, that the Federal Reserve is supposed to have a vice chairman for supervision. That was seven years ago. It is in the law. I mean, it's very simple. The Federal Reserve shall have a vice chairman of supervision. He will report to the Congress every six months. Why don't they have one? Now, they had a guy who's very good working there, but he hasn't got the title. He hasn't got the authority. He doesn't go testify at Congress and tell them how got a good job, a bad job the Federal Reserve did on supervision and how they were carrying out the mandate for overall surveillance. Why not? And Yeah, could I, I follow up that gentleman's point with uh, INET in its blog published a summary of a paper by three scholars at Barcelona. They looked at uh, what executives in the large banks did with their own portfolios as the banking crisis approached. And what they showed was that the top five officials and only the top five were selling out. They weren't selling out the bank's portfolio. And it seems to me this points to exactly as he suggested. There are more principal agent problems in there in the banks you know, than anybody's it's mentioned it's thus far. interesting you cite that. I go back in memory. Why do we have Glass-Steagall? Because then in the great Pecora investigators of what they found, the chairman of the Citibank was selling stock short right. in the midst of the crisis. I, right. Selling it short. <laughs> And uh, so we have glass steagall yeah, uh, But we don't have any proposal to address I mean, this, and it's not in your proposal either, right? No. I mean, this is a problem. Well, we don't got any proposal about pay practices. I, the incentives are terrible, obviously. Okay. Well, I... Uh, you talk about... <laughs> Just a general question. What uh, somebody raised this morning, what contribution has all this financial engineering made to the good of the world? And you have this thing, so I read something, and these numbers don't sound right to me, but the direction is right, that the value added in the GMP numbers from the world of finance was 2% of the GDP 30 years ago, now it's 8%. This is, this financial system really added, tripled the real contribution to the growth of the GIP and the happiness of everybody. Apparently somebody asked me the question how that took place. My answer was that's because the salaries went up. And that's what they quoted in the, <laughs> in, the, in the GMP number. They take whatever you pay, that's the contribution to the GDP. It's very hard to find a correlation between all this financial engineering and uh, growth of the economy. I'm not going to generalize too far from a correlation, but it's an interesting correlation. The more engineering, the slower the growth. Um. Well, I think uh, <laughs> I have to recall a few years ago when I was beginning INET, 
my son in his mid-20s said, Dad, what is it that you're fighting for? And I told him that I thought what we were really fighting for was the death of two romances. The first romance was that unfettered free markets can do it. <laughs> and the second was that government can fix it. <laughs> and when we trod down the track a few years, and uh, Chairman Volcker and I started talking about the Volcker Alliance, I was very excited because I thought, perhaps I can't dispel the romance, the government can fix it, but he can repair the government so it's not a romance anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, but that is the, you know, that's the basic quandary that we're in. I had a correspondence with a conservative guy who, who wrote an article on the subway to nowhere. He could have been talking about New York. He was talking about Washington and all the difficulties. He said, trouble of government is they can't administer anything. Well, so I wrote him a letter and said, yes, I'm, I'm interested in administering things better. Stop hopping on this and help us administer better. He said, no, you know, you can administer it better, but all those progressives will just use your more efficient government to do worse things. So <laughs> we don't want to do that anymore. Uh, but this, oh, I do get it in some ways, yeah. I mean, it's infrastructure. It's, that is an interesting question in public administration. Can we efficiently and effectively allocate these billions of dollars we're going to spend on infrastructure effectively? The two big infrastructure, I, people get tired of me saying this, but I happen to pass it by every day. The two big infrastructure projects in New York City, $10 billion to bring Long Island Railroad trains in from Long Island to Grand Central instead of Penn Station. And to get there, they gotta go through a tunnel under the East River, they gotta go way up and around. They've gotta dig 60 or 80 feet below Manhattan to get underneath all the other infrastructure to build this train tunnel into Grand Central for three or four planes of trains a day. Now that's known as the Tomato thing. He came from Long Island, he was great at finding money for Long Island and New York. Uh, they generally said to be potholes. This is not a pothole. This is $10 billion. They are expanding a subway right near where I live, 2nd Avenue subway. It will go from 96th Street to 63rd Street, where it will connect up with an existing subway. It's another $10 billion project. It's been tearing up the street for three and a half years. Those are by far the two biggest infrastructure projects in New York City for years. I don't know what the cost-benefit ratio yeah. would be by any <laughs> reasonable calculation. But how do you prevent, you know, the political decisions to where you locate this infrastructure and how do you deal with that? You get some modicum of uh, rationality and the thing is very difficult. I am sure we have enormous infrastructure needs. We built those two things. We're building it for $20 billion when we really do need a new tunnel under the Hudson River. Um, we've needed it for 20 years, and there it sits. Well, I think, I think we're, we're have running out of time and patience. So uh, let me say at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, we were inspired to work with you. <laughs> I've heard people pay tribute to you. Today, I know Kevin, you said he had excavated by creating a credibility that you inherited at the Federal Reserve. And all of that is extraordinary. But I actually want to underscore something even more beautiful. And that is that now, at this time in your life, you're doing this. This isn't past. This isn't nostalgia. This is embracing a challenge in this moment. And that's truly beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>